Hello everyone, this is Pastor Dirk, and welcome to another session in our course on Who Wrote the Bible. Today we'll be looking at uh, perhaps what is the most difficult book in the Old Testament to understand and interpret, the book of Daniel. Per perhaps because it covers such a wide range of history and it's filled with such imagery, uh, pictorial imagery and symbols, it, it creates a great deal of conversation and has created a great deal of conversation over the centuries about who wrote it, uh, what is the origin of this book. So I thought it deserved its own session so we can understand what are the challenges around this book and how do we uh, respond to them. So let's take a look first at the traditional view for much of the history and through most of Christendom, the belief was that it was written, and for Judaism, by the way, as well, it was believed that it was written by this man named Daniel, who was taken captive during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, where Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah. He took him captive into Babylon, and this man served in Babylon, suffered in Babylon, and also under the next emperor, the Cyrus, the emperor of Persia. Under both of those conquerors, he served in those kingdoms. And near the end of his life, probably around 530 BC, he actually writes these things down and records them for us. Now, as we said about the books of Moses and Isaiah, when we say that Daniel wrote this, we're not necessarily saying he wrote every single word that we find here. However, we are saying that everything that he reports is history. That it's not fantasy, it's not a myth. What he says, he saw, he saw. What he says, he heard, he heard. He's giving us facts as he sees them. That's the traditional view, that the entire book is Daniel's story. So that's where we begin. In order to understand the challenges surrounding that view, we need to back up and get a little look at the context. It's important to understand the things that were going on at the time, historically, geographically, in order for us to grasp the significance of these challenges. So let's look then at the context. I kind of put here, or I put here to get us started, this quotation from the last chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, David himself writes, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this? And he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. I find this comforting. I mean, here's the author of the book who said, I saw this, but I don't understand what it means. And he's being assured just, just your job is to write it down, to preserve it, to keep it. And in its day, God will reveal what these signs mean. And we've followed it through. And obviously some of those signs revealed in the New Testament. Some of those signs are picked up again and reused in Revelation, and some of those signs perhaps we have yet to see in the future. So uh, take some comfort if you're challenged by this book. It is uh, both mystery and revelation. God is revealing things, but some things are wrapped in mystery. So uh, we have to kind of keep that in mind as we're seeking to un untangle what is being said here. Let's look then at the historical setting in which this book was written. We're here at the end of the kingdom of Judah. Now, you remember at that particular time, what we now know as Israel was broken up into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. In our last session, we talked about the book of Isaiah, and he lived at a time when that northern kingdom Israel fell to the Assyrians, 722 BC. So for a period of time, the southern kingdom of Judah stood by itself. Well, now Daniel is alive when that kingdom comes to an end. There are three kings at the end of the line of Judah here. And the last king, Zedekiah, tries to rebel against the Babylonian rule. And Babylon has had enough. And so the armies come in and they destroy uh, Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. It's one of the most cataclysmic events in the history of Judaism with that beautiful temple that Psalm had built uh, hundreds of years earlier, now is raised to the ground. And the people of Judah are taken captive. They're carried into Babylon, at least the uh, many of them, those that are at the 
kind of top of the socioeconomic ladder. They're taken uh, captive and transplanted into Babylon. So that's the end of Judah as we know it for that, for that particular time. And then uh, some years later, some 70 years later, uh, Cyrus, the new emperor, declares that they may return. So we're in that period between when Jerusalem was conquered, 586, 587, and the return of those people in 538. So that's really the historical time frame in which we're speaking. Now during this particular time, there were two empires that rise up and overcome. Up until that point, it was the Syrian Empire. Now the Babylonian Empire comes in. There's a series of emperors there. Nebuchadnezzar is the one who comes in and does the destruction. Uh, he is followed uh, by this person, Nabonius, uh, Nab Nabonidus. Now, Nabonidus, we, we, he's not mentioned in the book of Daniel, but his son is Belshazzar, and we'll talk a little bit about that during the historical challenges. The other person that follows is the Persian emperor. Uh, in 539, uh, Cyrus is the one who comes in and conquers the Babylonian empire, and now the Persians and the Medes run that empire. So he features prominently in this book. And he appoints this uh, other king, Darius the Mede, as his underling. Now that's a matter of historical controversy, and we'll talk about that later. But I just want to give you the framework here, both in Judah and in that area. Now, geographically, we're talking here about the area we now know as uh, Iraq, uh, somewhat Iran. Uh, that's the area over here where the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley is placed. So geographically, we're talking about an area where um, various, in three separate waves, Babylon came in and they took captives Daniel was probably in that first range of captives, probably 605, something like that. Uh, and in 597, another range. And then I said, uh, as I said earlier, after uh, the king of Judah tries to rebel, the last wave comes in and just uh, conquers the city and takes, uh, takes the captive, it takes more captives and destroys the temple. So basically, Daniel now is over here in Babylon uh, in the area of uh, the Tigris Euphrates. It's now in this area we call Iraq. And that is where he is right now. Uh, and he hears back. He's receiving reports back from his homeland in Judah about the destruction of the city. So that's the geographical context of the story. Now, uh, this is where things start to get interesting as far as the history and the complexity of Daniel. Uh, throughout the story, he, Daniel sees visions of various empires. Two of them are during his lifetime. We just talked about it, the Neo-Babylonian Empire and uh, the Persian Mede Empire here called the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, those empires happen and those uh, conquerings of Judah, they happen uh, during Daniel's lifetime. But then he has visions of further empires. One is the Greek Seleucid Empire, the one that begins with Alexander the Great when he comes in and it takes over, inst installs his uh, empire across the world, eventually including Judah. And then after the Greek Seleucid Empire, well, of course, we have the Roman Empire uh, and the founding of that, especially as it pertains to Judah around 63 B.C., uh, that date it can move depending on what you're looking at, but essentially 63 BC. So here's the big challenge. If, if Daniel is seeing visions that are clearly pointing to the Greek Seleucid Empire and to the Roman Empire, who, who wrote those? Did Daniel actually see those visions? And that's the challenge. And when you go through and look at the visions that he sees, they're so particular and so um, precise about some of these things that it seems to be very, very clear that either he received a divine revelation about these things, or somebody had to be living at the time of these empires to actually write these words. They're that meticulous and that accurate, and that's the challenge because of the empires there. Uh, just to look quickly at the outlines so we can see the context and uh, kind of the challenges to interpreting, it, it kind of falls into three sections. 
The first section is an introduction to Daniel and his ministry, and it's written in Hebrew. But then you have this second section from chapters 2 through 6, and that is where he has all these dialogues with various kings or princes in the, in the realm, that, where he uh, interprets their dreams for them, and this is mostly written in Aramaic. And so it's another section in mostly an entirely different language. And then the last portion of the book, chapters 7 through 12, um, they, it's kind of a transitional section. Chapter, or I mean, chapter seven is kind of a transitional chapter. It, it's written in Ar Aramaic, but then it transitions us to ver uh, chapters eight through twelve, and that part is in Hebrew, and that's visions, just visions of the future. Primarily, that's what we're talking about. So when you just look at the book, it's broken down into these three sections: the Hebrew section, an Aramaic section, and then a transition in Aramaic to another section in Hebrew. Obviously, when critics look at this, there's a challenge. Uh, did the same writer write in all these languages? Was he proficient in all these languages? Or were there different authors? So it's one of the challenges that we're dealing with. Incidentally, I put down here uh, a fragment. There were eight fragments of Daniel found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Remember, that's uh, the collection of scrolls that were found that date somewhere for the first or second century. Again, this gives us an idea that these books, by this particular time, which would have been, say, some 300 or 400 years after they were written, that they're preserved, along with other sacred texts in this cave. So it gives us an idea that Daniel was uh, seen as uh, important literature, if not sacred literature, certainly in that period. Now, when we go to, uh, let me just say a few words about this thing called apocalyptic literature. This is a different type of literature. One of the reasons Daniel's so difficult to interpret is because it's written in a different um, genre, if you will, of literature. Apocalyptic has um, a couple different um, features. It's a way that God reveals, and rather than a straightforward kind of uh, words, rather even than uh, kind of the way God uses symbols like the birth in Isaiah or Ezekiel sleeping on his side. That's, or I mean, uh, Ezekiel sleeping on his side. Those are ways in which the prophet himself becomes an image of this truth. In a, in a, uh, this apocalyptic literature, the visions are given in very graphic messages through heavenly messengers. Uh, a lot of angels in apocalyptic literature telling us you know, what God is saying, what God is thinking, but through through these angelic messengers, through these visions that are given through these messengers, and they're pictorial, uh, they're very symbolic, they're very artistic. The pictures and images that you get there, you can't really draw them. I mean, you, you go through and you find people trying to draw pictures of what Daniel saw or what John saw in Revelation, and they're never really good pictures. You can't really put these words and capture them in a 2D image. They're just too uh, uh, variated and too contoured. They were meant to be word pictures that you can imagine, but it's really hard to put it down in media. The other reality is that a lot of times the reasons for all this, the heavenly messengers and the symbolic literature and all that, it's to convey to us that there's another reality. There's an eternal reality beyond us. You know, we live in space and time, but beyond us, in a way we can barely conceive, where time is not a factor and space is not a factor, there's another reality, there's another realm. Perhaps we could call it heaven, whatever it is we want to call it. But it's the realm of God, where time and, and space, he's not confined by time and space. And from time to time, he interjects into our world from time and space. And apocalyptic literature is a way of saying, there's reality going on out there. God is moving. God is, is doing things. God is real. There are truths out there that are all already settled and revealed, or settled and established. But we haven't yet realized them. We haven't experienced them here in space and time. And so we get that tension between eternity and the time and space in which we live. So all that's true of apocalyptic literature. We find it here in Daniel, a little bit in Ezekiel, and certainly in Revelation. So to understand them and to get our arms around them, we really have to appreciate this different type of literary genre.
Well, anyway, uh, let's kind of now, based upon this context, let's step back and look some of the challenges. It's interesting that Daniel is one of those books that was challenged very early. This is a quotation we have. It's cited in, in Jerome's commentary on Daniel from clear back in the, uh, uh, the third century. He, he's writing this commentary on, uh, on Daniel, citing this person from, called Porphyry from the third century. So already a couple hundred years after Christ, uh, there are people uh, questioning who wrote this book. And here's this quote. He wrote the 12th book against the prophecy of Daniel, denying that it was composed by the person to whom it is ascribed in its title. So this challenge is against Daniel. It's been around for a long time because of its sweeping references to the future. It's hard for people to get their minds around how Daniel could see so far into the future. So it's not new, these challenges. Let's talk a little bit about those uh, modern challenges. And I give you a few names there if you want to look them up so you can kind of read their writings yourselves and uh, get acquainted with their arguments. There's some beginning way back in the 18th century. Folks began to question Daniel. And it was during that time we talked about in the last session where humanity kind of stepped to the front and they began to see scripture not as a divine word of God, but as another human text, as a, a, just another piece of ancient literature. And so they began dissecting it and breaking it into its components to discover its origin. And as they did that, these different theories emerge about who actually wrote the book. And it's also represented in more modern folks. Uh, Raleigh is a very important uh, scholar in this field who really went after this idea of Daniel and the different late dating. And a couple other folks are out there and you can check it out. Uh, let me give you this summary. It comes from an introduction to Old Testament survey uh, by the author uh, Gleason Archer, wonderful uh, gifted scholar. Uh, I would recommend if you're looking for a reference to kind of read through the material and see what the argument, the case for and against and so forth. Uh, this is an excellent work, Arson Gleacher, uh, Gleason Archer, I'm sorry, uh, this introduction to Old Testament survey. Great, great book to have. But he makes this quote. He says, the great majority of critics regard this book as entirely spurious and composed centuries after the death of the 6th century Daniel. They understand it to be a work of historical fiction composed about 167 BC and intended to encourage the resistance movement against the tyranny of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, in this century, there is this uprising by this group called the Maccabees against the Greek Seleucid uh, raid in their area, in Judea. Uh, and there is uh, there's a, a terrible event there where Antiochus goes into the temple, brings a pig head and all kinds of other disgraceful things there. And it's this scandal that just puts the Maccabean who leads the revolts they just lead this revolt against the Antiochus and his armies in that particular century. And there are so many references in the book of Daniel to that those events that these critics are looking at and said, well, this is contemporary history. Who, whoever wrote these books must have been familiar with what's happening in this part of the world under Antiochus. So there must be someone wrote it. So the idea is someone from that period wrote it and they kind of projected it back into history and made up this character, Daniel, who wrote this stuff and tried to use ancient history as a way to inspire people, keep up the rebellion. The, the, the same way this hero, Daniel, fought back against the Babylonians and, and fought, fought back against Cyrus. You should be fighting back too against Antiochus. And so that's the, the image. And that way, everything you see in Daniel from these sections, it's history written at the time of those events that wasn't prophecy predicted in the future. So that's the general um, overview of the criticisms, the modern challenges to this. Now, it takes different forms. Sometimes there are actual authors assigned to them. Sometimes it's schools of authors, different works written at different time. But generally speaking, most of them uh, do not believe that there was a historical Daniel who wrote this. 
Some are willing to say parts of it were written earlier, uh, around 300, partially because, well, quite frankly, the, we have the source material, like they're found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's recorded in the Septuagint. So it, 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 certainly some of these works were already in place. So some of the works they're willing to say were written maybe 300 BC or some portions of it, and the rest written later. So different theories, but generally the idea that what they're agreed upon is that it definitely was not written by Daniel somewhere in the 500s. So that's the, the general tendency of the recent critics. Now, their arguments are based upon somewhat on history and somewhat on language. So let me kind of break those apart and give you a little bit of awareness of what uh, some of those criticisms are. Now, one regarding history has to do with the listing of the books. As we find them in various listings in Jewish tradition, the book of Daniel is often and mostly included among the group of writings known as writings. You remember when we talked about the Hebrew Bible, there are three sections. There's the Torah, which is the Pentateuch, the first five books. There are the prophets, and then there are the Ketuvim, or the writings. In many of the lists of Old Testament books, Daniel is recorded among the Ketuvim, meaning its later writings. Therefore, they said, well, even in Jewish tradition, so the critics argue, that even in Jewish tradition, Daniel's not regarded as a prophet. He's regarded among the writings. Now, uh, that's an interesting observation. The, the challenge or the pushback to that is within the Ketuvim, we also have, for example, the Psalms. And many of those Psalms were said to have been written by David, even earlier by Moses and, and others, but certainly by David. And David certainly had this ability to see into the future too. Many of those Psalms are prophetic predictions about the Christ. And so just because Daniel was listed among the Ketuvim or the writings does not in and of itself mean that he had no prophetic input or no prophetic role because even David fell in that role. I think the difference in between uh, maybe David and, and Daniel is that they were more politicians. That is, they were political leaders. They weren't called as a prophet in terms of they weren't part of a prophetic school. They weren't prophets pure and simple. They, they had this other role as a king, as, or, or, or in case of David, a government official, or in case of Daniel, a government official. So um, maybe not seen purely as a, as a prophet, which is why his writings could classify to men Ketuvim. But it doesn't mean there isn't prophecy there, just as there is prophecy also in the Psalms. The other criticism that is sometimes leveled is that in this work, somewhere around the time of the Antiochus uh, rebellions in the second century BC, there was a writer by the name of Ben Sirach uh, in Ecclesiasticus, that's the book he wrote. It's a, a wisdom book. And in that book, he lists out the Hebrew prophets. And he's a very respected author, uh, passed down through the generations in Judaism. And he doesn't list uh, Daniel among the prophets. And so the argument goes, if this great scholar who was alive this early in time isn't willing to say that Daniel was among the prophets, then maybe he wasn't listed. Maybe he wasn't regarded as a prophet. So again, his work could be considered as uh, kind of written later, not as important. But again, Ben Sirach, he's not, he's not, he's talking about the prophets as they're listed in the prophetic books. He's not necessarily excluding uh, Daniel in that statement. And he, by the way, isn't the one who, um, He's just one voice among many. So it's an interesting observation, but by itself doesn't eliminate Daniel as a prophet. When we get into the more core historic issues, let me just raise a couple of them that are often discussed. One has to do with an internal conflict within the scriptures themselves. In the first chapter of Daniel, the invasion is placed in the third year of Jehoiakim. That's when the invasion is is dated the third year of that king. But when you go to uh, uh, Jeremiah, that same invasion is relegated to the fourth year. So which is it, the third or the fourth? If Jeremiah is accurate in the fourth, then, and he's kind of seen as uh, an uncontested prophet, then Daniel, uh, 
he got the year wrong. So whoever was writing this, so the argument goes, uh, they were guessing, they guessed, they guessed wrong. So this wasn't somebody who was living during the time who knew the date. This was someone that was writing later and got the year wrong. This is an interesting observation, but since the evolution of archaeology and the interpretation of this history, it becomes clear that calendars were kept differently in different parts of the world. And uh, it's not like today where we all kind of work around the same calendar where there's BC, AD or BCE and CE and everybody's working off the same calendar internationally. No, in this time, it's kind of hard to imagine, but calendars started over with the beginning of each king. Uh, you just started with year one all over again. So depending on who was king, they just started the calendar over again. And when that you start year one in the person's reign, it varied from nation to nation. In the Jewish calendar, the political calendar was tied to a religious calendar. Just to make things more complicated, they had two calendars, a religious calendar and a political calendar. And the political calendar, they the way they counted year one was a little bit different than the way the Babylonians counted year one. And if you look at that difference without getting into too much technical detail here, there's a reason why. Uh, when Daniel is talking, he's talking from a Babylonian perspective. Somebody who's there in Babylon, it would be counted as the third year. But if you're from a Judean perspective and you live in Judah and you're using their calendar system, it would be the fourth year. So that's really a possible explanation to the reason why the two different year numbers are given. There's another uh, historical challenge having to do with is uh, Belshazzar. And uh, as we saw earlier, Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus. And uh, in the Daniel text, especially in Daniel 5, he's referred to as a king. But so it is argued that elsewhere in literature, in extra biblical literature, Belshazzar wasn't a king. He was simply the son of a king. Nabonidus was was the king and so the argument goes that this is a mistake to include the author included mentioned Belshazzar as a king when in fact he wasn't a king again archaeology has kind of put some holes in that theory uh, they found inscriptions throughout in different places where it looks like Belshazzar and Nabonidus kind of reigned as go heirs there are citations of um, words of prohibition, commands issued in the name of the king and his son, as if they co-ruled. And it turns out Nabonidus spent a lot of the time away from his kingdom fighting on the, on the frontiers. And so uh, Belshazzar is left in the palace to reign in his place. So it's not entirely out of the question that Belshazzar would have been seen as a king in the area of Babylon. In fact, it turns out that Perhaps maybe the writer of the book of Daniel knew a little bit more about history than the critics are accusing him. The other biblical problem we have has to do with Darius the Mede. There are no explicit external extra biblical references to this person called Darius the Mede, and he figures prominently in various chapters in the book of Daniel. Uh, one of the possible responses to this is that he may have been seen in history as a different person. Uh, when Cyrus invaded, he employed a general by the name of Gabaru. Gabaru was a Mede, and he was one of the generals who helped Cyrus implement his um, takeover of the Babylonian Empire. And he was put in charge as an administrator of all this. And scholars have looked at his life and what's said about him in the extra biblical material and it seems to line up very nicely what is implied about him in the book of Daniel and so the theory goes that Gubaro and Darius the Mede uh, maybe were the same person also there's been a suggestion that the name Darius itself is a royal name now the only other extra biblical Darius we have comes later he comes later uh, in the in the story and the critics believe, well, maybe the, the author of this book just conf got it confused and put Darius in the wrong time place. But what if Darius is a name kind of like Caesar? 
like Caesar was known, it was just the name that was assigned to the person in charge. And what if Darius is one of those kind of names? So it's just possible responses. Again, a legitimate uh, a challenge, I suppose, that we can't find this name extra biblically. But just because it hasn't appeared yet or we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean he didn't exist. I mean, for years, people said the Hittites didn't exist until we found out they did exist. So the argument from silence is, is never really a convincing argument by itself. It always requires kind of a tenuous response. Let's wait and be patient and see. But it is interesting to compare these two individuals, this Darius the Mede and Gabaru, and wonder if they're not the same person. So that's kind of the highlights, if you will, uh, the, the big picture as far as the historical criticism. So let's look a little bit about language. Um, as I said, one of the challenges about Daniel is that there are check, chunks of it written in Aramaic. And the question is, why was so much of it written in Aramaic? Well, let me just say up front that Aramaic um, was a international language, kind of uh, like for a time, Greek was the international language in the New Testament. Eventually, Latin became the international language that was spoken throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, now, I guess you might say English is an international business language that even though it's not the local language, it's the language that everybody uses. Well, Aramaic was originally a Syrian language that was adopted in during the Assyrian Empire and became this international trade language. And so there are chunks of Daniel written in this international trade language, apparently to be consumed by uh, the people in that area. So if someone was writing in the area of Babylon, if they wanted the Babylonians to understand it and see it, they would not write in Hebrew, they would write in Aramaic. So what this tells us is that there, there are uh, chunks. Some whoever wrote this book had to be able to write in both Aramaic and Hebrew. Well, Daniel qualifies for that if he's a real person. But you see, if Daniel doesn't exist, then the theory has to be, well, you have one author who writes in Aramaic and a different author that writes in Hebrew, unless you have someone who is fluent in both. And the historical figure Daniel that is represented in his own book is someone who would have been versed in both languages, uh, both the Hebrew from his childhood and also the Aramaic as he served in leadership there in Babylon. Now in Aramaic, because every language is an evolving language, words get imported and brought in from other languages and used. And what we see in the Aramaic as we have it in Daniel is that some words from the Persian Empire are brought in. Persian words are imported into the Aramaic language. And so the theory goes, well, if there are Persian words in here, this couldn't have been written in the sixth century by Daniel. This had to be later after these words became um, prominent. Well, it turns out that uh, there's not as many uh, uniqueness, unique words as they thought. There's only a few. And remember now, Daniel did live, at least historically, he, according to the traditional view, he did live into the period of Cyrus. There was a period where he was active during the Persian reign. So it's not entirely out of the question that he would have access to these Persian words in his text. And the Aramaic form, sometimes it's argued from a later period. So sometimes there's an argument there and again, without getting to too much linguistic detail, a lot of these speculations that they were later forms, again, this is an archeology span thing. Is it just that we haven't found these documents yet? We haven't proved that they're from later forms. We just haven't found them yet. And scholars from the traditional view point out that there are just as many and more usage of contemporary uh, forms that would have been appropriate to the 6th century period and not later. In other words, a person written later Aramaic would not use words the same way. So the arguments go both ways. And sometimes there's language based upon word meanings. There's an interesting word that in our NIV is translated sometimes Chaldean and sometimes astrologer. And sometimes when you look at the original language of the text and you're reading through it, you see this word used both ways. And so the argument goes, well, this word to mean astrologer probably wasn't in existence in the 6th century, so it was must have been added later, this word that we translate astrologer, really 
instead of Chaldean? Well, the truth is that we not know that for sure. That That's a, a speculation. And in the book of Daniel, it's used in both ways, both as a, a Chaldean, that is an ethnic term, a racial term. It's about somebody who's from this area, but also in a specialist way. In other words, that people uh, were known internationally, the Chaldeans were known as having these wise men that could prophesy like this. It's interesting to me then in the New Testament that when you see these wise men coming from the east, to me that's a very powerful image. It's like they're coming from the east, the, the same wise men that were around during the time of Daniel who saw these visions of the Son of Man coming are actually now their 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 ancestors or their descendants rather their descendants now are coming from the east to see the fulfillment those very wise men that were around now to hear daniel's vision are now showing up in judea to see the fulfillment of those visions it's a nice uh, it's just another reminder of this great architect this great author who's weaving the story through the centuries and also by the way when it comes to language what's very helpful for us is this group this papyrus knows that the elephantine papyrus because it comes from that area of Egypt. Uh, it's an Aramaic script written in the fifth century and we now have this to compare. It's about a century later than what we say Daniel was writ written in but finding it and comparing it it's given us a great deal of insight as to the the state of Aramaic and shown that really some of the forms you see in the book of Daniel in the sixth century BC are there in this elephantine uh, papyrus in the fifth century as well. So it gives us some uh, uh, credence to believe that this was indeed an ancient document. So that's a, a, just a quick overview of some of the reasons for the challenges. Well, how do we respond to these? Let me give a couple um, big thoughts. I've already kind of walked through uh, responses individually to these criticisms and I invite you especially to go to that Gleason Archer introduction book and you can go through them in more detail but let me give some big picture responses you know sometimes you know, if you just pile up a lot of these challenges and you put them together and you just look at the number of them you say wow there's a lot of challenges uh, sometimes you hear people say well there's so many inaccuracies in, in the Bible and they just kind of see that as a, a reason to say, well, it can't be true because there's just a long list of questions and challenges. What I would say is, look, these are legitimate questions, but just because you have a long list of them doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. You kind of have to look at the individual list of challenges and questions and go through them. And really just the sheer number of them doesn't by itself indicates that something should not be trusted. And when you get into these conversations, often I ask people to be specific when they say things like the Bible's not true or Daniel is so inaccurate or there are so many inaccuracies. Then I always kind of, if I have a chance and it's in a good friendly environment and we're trying to, we're trying to encourage discussion here, I just push back and say, well, let's talk about one of them. Let's just talk about one of them. Let's just get around those. Because what I've found over the centuries, there are some still unresolved questions. Of course, there are areas where archaeology and the Bible don't line up. But archaeology is always a developing science. There are a lot of things that have not yet been discovered. So I'm always willing to discuss individual situations. And quite frankly, sometimes you say, I'm not sure. I don't know. But what we can't um, take away is... We, what we can't assume is simply because there are a lot of challenges and a lot of questions that they're, they're a valid argument against the authentic, authenticity uh, of Scripture. There are always tons of questions that need to be explored. And as I pointed out earlier in other responses, we have to be careful of these arguments for silence. There are no extra biblical references to, as if the biblical record, it's assumed, is not... Uh, historical so we have to look for extra biblical material to get to guarantee it and I always say you know be careful in that kind of argument because you never know what archaeology is going to find just because we haven't found it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist there's always stuff being found uh, there are various websites out there I subscribe to them you know archaeology 
biblical archaeology, there's archaeology from the East, all kinds of sites out there that are constantly producing new findings. It's a constantly evolving. So those, we have to accept these arguments from silence tenuously. Obviously, corroborating evidence is helpful. So if a biblical citation and an extra-biblical citation are in agreement, that's helpful. That's, that corroborates one another. We're looking for corroborating evidence. But there's no reason to say that the extra-biblical is any more reliable than the biblical. They're both historical witnesses. There's just mysteries yet as to how these things link together. So let's be careful about how we accept arguments from silence on both sides. And the last thing I would say is that underneath, sometimes when people say things like the Bible's not true or the, the book of Daniel isn't acceptable or believable, there's a hidden assumption there that prophecy and miracles are just, they're just uh, myth, they're, they're legend, they can't be real. And so sometimes these historical arguments and these linguistic arguments aren't really the problem. I mean, people are raising them as objections, but that's not really the, the real issue. The real issue underneath is this assumption that the Bible is really just uh, human literature, that there's nothing divine about it, that it's not inspired. And when we get into those conversations, then I try to push back and say, what if it is the case? In other words, it, we're kind of begging the question here. The whole point of the biblical story is that it is divine revelation. What we are arguing is that this is God's story. He is telling a story. And rather than just reject that out of hand and say, no, he's not, therefore I'm not going to accept it as true, well, that what the proper response should be, well, let's explore it. Let's understand it. Let's see it. Now, I realize a lot of religions have a theory that says God revealed this truth. And I say, that's great. That's, that's your theory. Let's look at the story. Let's look at the story that's in these other scriptures. Let's examine it. Let's see if it makes sense. That's the invitation. I taught world religions. I, I, I love to look at those other stories. Let's look at the substance of them. Do they make sense? Do they answer the questions? Do they, do they make their case? And the same is true as the biblical story. I mean, that's really the question. Let's look at it. Let's examine it. When people question whether the Bible is God's story, that's a great conversation to have. Well, I, let's kind of clear the hedges, to use Odds Guinness's term, you know, if, if people are objecting to particular things about history or language, let's have that conversation. But let's get to the bigger conversation. Is God really speaking through this? And my experience and my belief is that the whole story of Scripture from beginning to end makes a convincing case. It paints such a beautiful picture over centuries. Yes, it's hard to understand sometimes. Yes, it's a little confusing. Yes, there are questions. But as you stand back and look at it, it's such a powerful witness to the communicating power of God. And that's really the issue. That's the question at hand. Is God speaking through this story? And it's if you reject that out of hand, if you just say it can't be, therefore let's get down here and just figure another explanation because that explanation can't be true. Well, that's begging the question. And it's really the question that should be begged and asked and engaged in and discussed. Is God speaking through the story? And in fact, in the end, that is the whole point of Daniel. That is what God is asking his people to do, is to read the story, to understand it. He's leaving a witness. He's writing this in this prophet to leave a witness. And that would be our conclusion to this text. Let's just look at this last passage. It's from Daniel chapter 6. Darius is having this, uh, uh, he, he's, he's replying after he had this uh, misguided uh, attempt to force Daniel to worship him. And he threw Daniel in his, in, into the lion's den. And God miraculously uh, protected Daniel. And this is the response that is recorded by this King Darius that we discussed. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel.
for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. See, that really is the whole point of the book, is for the world to see that there is a sovereign Lord over all the nations. And what he says goes. And when he wants to change emperors, he changes emperors. But he is the one who saves. And so the whole thrust of the story is this is God's story. He does these miracles. He gives these visions. He Centuries before they happen, so that when they do happen, people understand, wow, this must be God. That's really the story here. That's the story that deserves, that's the question that deserves to be addressed and answered. Is God speaking through this prophet? And the only way to know the answer to that is to read the story and try to sort it out. So thank you for listening to this particular session. Come back next week and we'll start talking about the New Testament and the Gospels. Who wrote those? So until then, may the Lord bless you and I hope to see you soon.